the Making, and I'm Teresa Ao. I'm so excited to be bringing you this podcast with intimate stories and life lessons from the creator economy. On In the Making, you'll hear from content creators, communicators, marketers, designers, and the folks who do a little bit of everything, the slashies. So join me every two weeks for revealing and honest conversations where we get to find out together how these creators overcome the challenges of being small business owners and creatives at the same time. Thanks so much for being here with us and let's get started. Today, I have the immense pleasure of speaking with Phil Palin. Phil is a personal branding expert and keynote speaker with a global following. As a brand strategist, Phil has advised hundreds of brands from over 30 countries, including a shark on Shark Tank, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, politicians, and some of the most important names in entertainment. His unconventional approach to digital marketing and his talent for social media makes him a must follow on Instagram and TikTok. And his podcast, called Brand Therapy, is a fantastic marketing resource. Phil also frequently appears as an expert contributor in media outlets around the world, including CNN, Access Hollywood, and the Daily Mail. Phil, thank you so much for being my guest today. Right here is exactly (laughs) where I want to be, okay? With you, Teresa, with you. Yeah, what I didn't say is we've also become friends since... I first met you last year at the Max Conference during the Adobe Ambassador Summit. It was amazing. It was amazing. We got to actually meet and chat and connect. And you're right. We've been friends ever since. I want to start from my audience to get to know you a little bit more. How did you become a brand expert? And what does it have to do with the star of two and a half men? (laughs) <laughs> you thought I forgot, right? Well, we'll tell that story. We'll tell the the short version, but it is exciting. And it's an important part of how I started. Did my master's degree out in Florida. A few months before I was set to graduate, I applied for a lot of internships, including one that was very public at the time, 2011. Charlie Sheen was all over the news. A little bit of a meltdown, public meltdown. <laughs> he created a, a social media internship and very public competition. Over 90,000 people around the world entered to become Charlie Sheen's social media intern at the peak of his craziness in the media. The submission, Teresa, was a tweet. That was the limit. Now you got my attention. I'm like, oh, I don't want to send a cover letter and a big long resume. No, I love this application, which was a single tweet. Which is actually harder to write, a short form. It is harder, particularly when you're up against that many people. So there were a few things that worked in my favor. I had practical skills, so I knew how to film a video. I was confident enough to put myself on video. I also am Canadian, and Canadians love any successful Canadians in media or sports. I certainly had one of the most visible campaigns, had videos I was working on with my friends, and really just trying to stand out and make people feel a part of this competition. I didn't want to be one of those annoying friends that was like, oh, vote for me, vote for me every day. You can vote every day. It's like, no, it's exhausting. Instead, I was thinking, how can I make this an experience that other people can be a part of? What are the angles of this story that keep it exciting? And people were really excited about it. In fact, my very first client came to me and said, do you have any friends that are like you because I've been following your journey in this internship competition. She said, can I hire any of your friends? And I said, I have good news. You can hire me because I actually need to pay rent. I'd moved out to LA. I did not win the internship competition. My first client was a wholesale candle and fragrance company in Ohio that hired me and paid me money to help with social media. And that set me up for entrepreneurship. It's all I've ever done. I never intended to be an entrepreneur, but I like being creative. I like clients. I want to dig into your expertise and ask, what is a brand? Most people think it's maybe a logo or a color scheme, but how do you define a brand? A brand is consistency. But now let's unpack that because I think as it relates to, let's say, design tools or creativity, people might think, well, a brand, that's 
a logo, really a logo is is only one element of it. I think a brand is handled, I guess, in three stages. So positioning your brand, thinking about what are your goals, you know, thinking about what are your competitive advantages? How are you different than other people? What language do we use to sum all of that up? That would be that first stage really. Then when we feel good about how we're positioned, being able to sum up your brand in a sentence. I'm a brand strategist and a content creator that helps people and companies position, build, and promote their brands. So I'm even sharing my process in my one sentence that I use to describe who I am and why people should care. This is now when we talk about potential a logo, but I would call that a brand identity, which includes logos, color palette, typography selection, how your brand will show up on web and print. And then I would incorporate in there as well, photography, a good photography in the brand build. And -hmm. then our web presence, which could be a website, it could be a LinkedIn profile, it could be a lot of different ways that we decide to position ourselves. And that final stage would be promote. How do we stick a for sale sign out front of that house and take it to market? What do creators in particular need to know about branding that might be totally different from the more traditional branding for a product or a store or even like a corporation? I've worked with startups and corporations over the years, but branding people is my specialty. I love that I can listen to someone's goals and actually use personal branding as a way to manifest those goals. So this isn't just about making something look pretty on the internet. What makes you great? What makes you different? Who do you call when you need someone who, you know, can show you how to choose a color palette, et cetera? What's the difference between branding and marketing? The truth is I don't think of them uh, as separate entities. I think about like a little target if we're playing darts, right? You're trying to get as close as possible to that middle point, which is how we describe to someone who you are, and really why they should pay attention to you instead of someone else. So branding is is the language, the visuals we use to describe that. Marketing is really the path or the paths that we take to get in front of our ideal audience. So you also talked about photography. Talk to me about what makes good photography. I always come back to this analogy of consistency, this idea that like what we're building online should represent who we are in real life. And photography is a little bit like the outfit, the makeup, the hair, all the energy you put into showing up in real life to go meet a friend, to go pitch to investors. All of us in real life put some kind of effort into how we show up in real life when we interact with people. On the internet, Your photos are those little soldiers that you send out into the internet to do that work for you. And so it's the one area of branding where I'm just not willing to skimp. You know, if you post a pixelated photo where you've cropped out your family from a family reunion in 2003, that ain't going to cut it nowadays. It's just not. Yeah. You said you want the photos to represent who the person is, but often on social media, I see tons of photoshopped, (laughs) doctored, beautified photos of people. And then when you see them in real life, they don't even look like that. It's a little bit like online dating. You go on a first date, you meet them, and they're nothing like how they've described themselves. Is that ever a positive experience? No. Certainly not. And it really goes for anything. I I think it's the same, though. I think now we juggle two versions of ourselves, the in-person experience and the online version. I think we all win when those two experiences are consistent and true. I have clients that have hired me, paid me money to go through the exercise of branding. And sometimes when it comes to the photo part, they are very self-conscious or they say, can we do this at the end? Or can we, can we get around taking photos? And it's difficult because it's like saying, I'm going to go meet a friend in real life, but I'm going to keep a bag over my head. Is that going to be fine? It's not about looking like a supermodel in your photos. It's about looking real in your photos. I want to talk a little bit about money. Oh, Um, I love that topic. (laughs) Relevant to this conversation, a vertical of my business that did not exist, Teresa, three years ago, I started it, is content creation. 
I decided to right before the pandemic dust off my YouTube channel because I got feedback from someone when I sent them a website demo, a client. And they said, wow, your demo was really good and fun to watch. You should be creating on YouTube. And so I thought, well, I like to make videos and I love to present and I love to try new tools and such. I made a YouTube channel just, just to try it out or just to have an outlet to create content in a format that I really enjoyed that fulfills me. Mm -hmm. The way that I make the majority of my money as a creator is through brand partnerships. So a brand will pay me because they feel confident in my ability to communicate about the platform that they have in a positive, informative, entertaining way. And I hit six figures last year in this vertical that did not exist three years ago, zero dollars three years ago. Wow. You said, let's talk about money, honey. So we're talking about money. <laughs> That's awesome. According to McKenzie, selling via social media is a small but rapidly growing segment. And by 2025, the social commerce sector is expected to swell to nearly, are you ready for the number? I'm ready. $80 billion. Wow. $80 billion in the US and to more than $2 trillion globally. If my listeners started a business on social platforms, or are planning to, do they even need a website, Phil? Is social only the way of the future? Because, you know, I buy stuff on Instagram a lot. I have to confess. So do I. So do I. I see the ads and then I'm like, oh, buy here now or whatever. They make it so easy. Well, yeah. Do people need a website? Let's answer that question first. I think websites are still incredibly valuable, if not solely for the output. Honestly, the exercise of making one is really important for the success of someone's business. Putting into language who you are and why people should care. That's hugely beneficial. So when I'm working on a website with a client, we've already got photos, we've got a brand identity. When we're working on a website, we're deciding what are your services? What is the language we use? How many services do you have? What do we want to focus on? You are an Instagram expert, so we all want to know, what should we post? What should we not post? When should we post? And why should we post? Yeah, it's a lot of questions. Some, <laughs> some are more important than others, so let's prioritize here. How often do I post? Probably three times a week on average. I do try to create like systems for myself so that, for example, I'm not just posting sponsored content all the time. You know, I have branded templates that I've created for myself in Adobe Express that enable me to create different types of content quickly. So if you go to my profile, you'll see there are text only carousels. I can make those the fastest. And if I've already gone through the process of creating a YouTube video where I share three tips, five tips on something, I can easily on a day when I don't even have to film, just paste over that information so someone can collect it or grab a piece of it on Instagram. So if I set myself up to only post photos or reels where I'm on camera, let's say every day, that wouldn't work for me. I'd post a lot less. Do you use the Adobe Express scheduler to plan your posts or do you do it on the spot? Mix of both. I'd say on, I'd say 80% of the time I do it in real time. I, I need the pressure to post day of. I like it. But yeah, that's certainly not what I recommend to someone who doesn't have the time or isn't sitting at their desk in the day to do it. It's always better to plan. Make your post. Don't, don't strive for consistency. Strive for joy, which is mm. also something you brought up. I think that's a really cool perspective. Like I would even take that a step further and say, be selfish about social media. You know, yes, it's important that your followers get something of value from you, but what do you get of value from, from content creation as a practice? Let me give you an example. If I go to make a YouTube video next week, I can choose a topic, Teresa, for a video that I'll post on Wednesday on a topic that I want to learn more about. Anyone who connects with me on Instagram knows I travel a lot. So I won't otherwise have the time to just casually 
research something, but if it's content that I'm creating, then it forces me, or at least it gives me that opportunity to actually learn more about that thing that I want to learn about. So I, mm-hmm. for me, content creation is how I learn. It's how I educate myself on, on trends and, and, and things out there that I want to know about and share with others. So for someone that's just starting out or not an expert regarding Instagram, when should they post? Is there a certain day or week? So my answer to someone that's not an expert on Instagram is to not worry about those questions. My answer is... Build a system, a content plan that is sustainable for you. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of clients. I'll be like, oh my God, I'm going to post every day, you know, and then it goes, you know, you post every day for a week and then you post zero times the next week. That's not consistent. I would rather you post two, three times a week than, you know, and do that for a couple months or longer than to go all in and then, and then disappear. You have to post regularly. I I'm also trying to do that, but it's hard. It's just hard, but it's achievable. When you post matters less than ever before, just because of, you know, the way the algorithm works, essentially when you post Instagram's what, or any social media platforms watching closely to see In the small pool that your post is shown to, let's say it's shown to 20 people, if 10 people or 15 people reply or engage on that post, then it's going to be seen by a much wider group of your followers. But a misconception nowadays, this is important to know if you're a beginner, your post is not guaranteed to be seen by everyone who follows you. The algorithm is designed to edit that and only show what it considers to be meaningful for that person. So it's much more important, you know, to keep up your content plan, to be fulfilled by the content that you're creating so that you're enticed to keep doing it. That's way more important than a day or time that you post. I worry less than ever before what time I post, what hashtags I use. So instead of a ton of hashtags, instead, you know, think about your caption being longer and going into more detail on what your post is about so that, you know, Instagram is, is definitely becoming an environment more driven by SEO, search engine optimization, far more important than stuffing hashtags into a caption or as a first comment, much more important that I think we take a step back and go, how can I create a system for myself that brings me joy? You know, that's way more important. Mm -hmm. It can be so intoxicating to try to increase the likes and page views, but it doesn't always translate right into more customers or income. What do you say to people who have gotten so caught up in chasing likes that they lose sight of why they're posting in the first place? I say, are those likes going to pay your rent next month? (laughs) No. (laughs) No. I mean, I guess if it's a brand deal or it's contingent on a sale, I mean, maybe there might be some scenarios, but it's unlikely. I've worked with clients that have huge businesses and focus so much on social media, I think just as a root of like approval and popularity, then it might be a good moment to pause and reprioritize based on what's going to give you the most sustainability as a business. Yeah. Yeah. What can you do to grow your audience when you've been posting consistently and nothing changes? If someone has been posting consistently and they're not growing in followers and they want to, most most cases where someone's not growing, it's because they're not spending enough time socializing, engaging, mm-hmm. commenting, DMing someone. You can't be so focused on just kind of passively creating something and throwing it out into the world, particularly if you're getting started or you don't have a ton of followers yet. It's not likely going to be seen by a ton of people. So here's what you should do. Split your time between creation and engagement and prioritize. Okay, each day I'm going to comment on five social media posts that resonate with me. And in a comment, I'm not going to say, love this, you know, like go into more detail. Otherwise it feels like spam and there's robots designed to do that. Instead, you know, think about how can I leave a comment that would grab someone's attention to actually go look at my profile? 
right? So let's say it's a brick and mortar. Let's say it's a jewelry store. You could comment on uh, a car dealership in the same town or think about what other businesses would attract your audience and leave a thoughtful comment. And, and so that's a really great way to increase visibility uh, on social media is just through meaningful engagement beyond just being so focused on on what you're broadcasting. You bring up such a great point. Yeah. All their output is posting, 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 but they're not engaging with others, with the community, with other creators and content creators. So thank you for that. I have two more questions, Phil. How can Gen AI help with branding and marketing? And have you used Gen AI yourself? So that's actually a really interesting question. Since spring, summer, I've really focused on AI tools and and how small businesses can incorporate AI into what they do. How can we use these tools, you know, in a way to help us create efficiencies or explore creative ideas that just exist in our mind? What about a mood board? Or maybe you're conceptualizing a product or better yet, now being able to create your own image using generative AI that's totally unique to you and what you write as your prompt and the settings that you have. Now it's not just finding the right stock photo, but it's actually thinking about how do I craft a prompt to create the right visual for this use? And that's a really new, exciting way for creatives to think. Yeah, it's a new muscle that they have to build. And it's a a brand new resource, right? And with anything new, people do get nervous or scared. But I think people can also have an open mind. And like you said, try it out for yourselves. You have nothing to lose, right? Exactly. Yeah. Tell me one word that's going to guide you for the rest of 2023. Sort of like a vision word that's top of mind for you. It's focus, really staying true to ourselves. Who are we? Really staying true to what matters in our careers and in our businesses, what fulfills us. Well, you know what you're doing. You're true to yourself. You're so authentic. And authenticity is really a big word for me. And thank you so much for being a guest and continue to be fabulous. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you for having me. A tremendous thank you to Phil Palin for joining me today. I had such a fun and eye-opening conversation with him. His fresh and positive take on brand building definitely inspired me to think more about my own social media presence and his invaluable insights regarding online marketing for small businesses and independent creators are something you can start using today. The key takeaways that stood out to me were, one, consistency is key. A brand is all about consistency of language, design, and style across platforms. Two, personal brands are based on self-awareness. Have a goal in mind and make sure that your brand reflects that vision. Be authentic to who you really are. Three, repurpose content across platforms and formats. Make it easy for yourself. Posting regularly isn't as hard if you have templates and content ready to go. Four, if your following isn't growing, you're not socializing enough. Don't just put out content, be part of a community. You have to engage. This is In The Making, and I'm your host, Teresa Ao. I am so excited to be bringing you this brand new podcast with intimate stories and life lessons from the front lines of the creator economy. On In The Making, you'll hear from content creators, communicators, marketers, designers, and the folks who do a little bit of everything, the slashies. So join us every two weeks for revealing and honest conversations where we get to find out together how these creators overcome the challenges of being small business owners and creatives at the same time. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I'm speaking with financial hype woman and a dear friend, Berna Anat. Berna grew up like me. We're both children of immigrants who didn't know 
a lot about how money works in the U.S. So she decided to be that voice for others. And thank you. And thank God. <laughs> thank you so much, Berna. She helps young people, women, and people of color to budget, pay off their debts, and save money to create a life they love based on lessons learned in her own life. Her inspiring videos live on Instagram and on her website, heyberna.com. And her best-selling book, Money Out Loud, is out now. I love that she is crushing her mission of making the finance world a little less male, pale, and stale. How I love that framing that you had created, I think. So, hey, Berna, it's a great joy for me to have you as a guest today. Not only is your personal story so inspiring, but you also have tons of practical advice for people within the creator economy and just anyone out there. Thank you for making the time to speak with us. Thank you so much for having me, Teresa. I'm so happy to be here. So let's rewind a bit and set the scene for the listeners. You were in your 20s working at Instagram, making good money for the first time, mm -hmm. but also had $50,000 in credit card debt and student loans. Yes. There's so much shame in our culture around debt. Most people would keep this a secret. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to start sharing all about it online? Oh, because I'm shameless. I just was never taught <laughs> to <laughs> shut up. But I remember being in like sixth grade, I had some sort of brain blip. Like I was like, okay, we are all awkward and weird. We're all self-conscious. And I was like, if we're all self-conscious, doesn't that kind of cancel out and mean that we like none of us should be self-conscious? I don't know where I was getting this brain download, maybe my ancestors. But I remember thinking that in sixth grade and then realizing like it sort of unlocked a part of my personality that was like, well, then I'm going to be the person, like the weirdest person in the room. I'm going to be the one to be like, wait, I didn't understand that. Go back. And so I think maybe to my fellow students, I became very annoying. And mm -hmm. I mean, you spoke about shame, right? Shame is the kind of thing that we all carry around about our financial lives, but it's also one of the top things that keep us from asking questions, keep us from sharing with each other and learning more. And so I, I do what I can to get rid of the shame, though. I know I was I was not born with a lot of shame in the first place. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think it's a sense of curiosity too. What kind of response did you get from posting about your debt? I was massive. I mean, massive in the sense that I had a very normal person's Instagram that, you know, it was like dog pictures, food, family, whatever. And when I entered into the ancient Caucasian art of budgeting, because I come from a family of immigrants. I'm a child of immigrants from the Philippines. My mom was a customer service agent at United for 30 years. My dad was a mail carrier. Nobody in my family had anything to do with finance. I came from a PR and communications background. And so when I was getting a more regular paycheck, I was like, okay, I kind of have no excuse but to try to manage this $50,000 of debt. And I put together the budget that worked for me, which it was, it wasn't spreadsheets and it wasn't apps. It was me opening a Google doc and journaling every time I got a paycheck. And then that sort of sixth grade, like why not mentality came out where I was like, okay, I know I have shame about my debt. I know that I've been taught throughout my life explicitly and not explicitly to never talk about money. But what would happen if I did? This was back in the days when it was okay to post a boomerang on your Instagram feed. Now I feel like Gen Z and millennials, but never. Mm -hmm. But I posted a boomerang of me scrolling up and down this Google Doc onto my Instagram. And the response was so wild. I got flooded with comments, first from a bunch of people that I knew. And then people started tagging their friends and asking a bunch of questions. And the comments were like, whoa, first of all, I didn't realize that you had this much debt and not in the shame sense. They're like, I have that much debt too, or I have more. I can't believe you're talking about it. But I think the most significant response I got were, were all the DMs. And you know, when you get a DM, it kind of feels like someone's whispering at you. Like, I just need to like keep it between me and you. Yeah. And so I was getting a ton of DMs being like, I didn't want to comment because I still feel shame about my money. So I didn't want people to know I was worried about money or anything, but your post really resonated with me. Now it's actually making me want to try to budget. So I was like, oh, we've hit a nerve here and we should keep going. I want to know what did you learn about money from your own family growing up? What emotions were there? 
Yes, it's exactly that, Teresa. It's the emotions that we learned first. I think it's like a study out of the University of Oxford in like 2018. A bunch of sociologists found that we develop our money brains and our money habits between the ages of seven and nine. Oh, very record scratch moment because you're like, what was I doing? And if you're, you have a background like ours, between the ages of seven and nine, no one's showing you like budgeting and investing flashcards. Mm -hmm. No one's even explaining to you how money truly works. And so in my household, we did not talk about money. We understood where we stood financially by context clues. I could pick up when my parents were tense. I could pick up the fact that they had been just, just been fighting about money. I could pick up when they're like, you think we have McDonald's money? We have rice at home. But what was so confusing, too, about my messaging in my childhood, and I share this very deeply unscientific theory all the time, and it really resonates with a lot of first-gen folks, I call it the frugal flex theory. May I? I know this. Go ahead. Please tell the audience. So my frugal flex theory, it points to why so many of us feel so confused about money growing up, especially in first-gen and immigrant families. At any given time, you are like ping ponging across the spectrum of very frugal or like flexing on your money. We'd have moments of like deep frugality, you know, like I'm at the Scholastic Book Fair and my parents didn't even know it was happening. And so I'm, I'm playing with the free bookmarks. Then you go to like a family party that night and my mom is wearing her head to toe, best Louis Vuitton Chanel, whatever she either could afford or like is definitely not real. <laughs> All the aunties dress the same. We're fighting over the bill. Are you kidding? I thought we were broke. Yeah. And so yep. confusion basically is what I experienced. Yeah, exact same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? It's yeah. deeply unscientific, but it's it's anecdata is what yeah. it is. So let's talk about your book, Money Out Loud. Yes. It is so practical and so fun, you know, Thank illustrated you. for a topic that is usually so serious. Mm -hmm. What other personal finance book has illustration and talks about saving for Beyonce tickets? Uh, so yes. I think that's Important. just so fun. So fun. Mm -hmm. Who did you write this book for? Because I know oh. you worked on it tirelessly for three yes. years. Who did you have in mind when you wrote this book? I love that question. Thank you so much for asking. I always knew that the number one person I've always wanted to help and talk through and make sure their lives are easier are my nieces. I feel very, very close to them. I have four. They are now 23, about to be 21, 18, and three. And so everything I do is to make sure that their life isn't confusing the way that our life was confusing and that maybe I can build a bridge for them so that it's not so hard for them to understand this part of their life. Then that's a great life to me. Again, brown woman, child of immigrants in the finance world, everything about me is like not supposed to be here. Yeah. And so here I am. You're starting them young. I mean, I love that. Just yeah. educating them. And I wish we had you when I was growing up. You know what oh I mean? Oh my gosh. So speaking of your book, your book Money Out Loud is subtitled mm -hmm. All the Financial Stuff No One Taught Us. Yes. What are the key areas we all need to know about? I mean, what didn't anyone teach you? Oh, all of it. You have to go through what you were taught first and break that down and unpack them. We're talking about feelings about your money. Mm -hmm. What were those things you learned from seven to nine? Because a lot of those things solidified into your adult brain. Either you are copying those things or you are reacting to overcorrect from those things. And a lot of the times that is what's causing you stress. I wish I was taught better emotional foundation about money, yeah. that it is a tool, that it's something you can get excited about to reach your goals, as opposed to what we did learn, which was shame and scarcity and fear and not enough. And then really what I wish they taught us in school, how to budget, what is debt, how do credit cards work? What's a credit score? Why do I care? Right. Investing, that's a really interesting aspect for young people. Yeah. Right now, young folks are learning about investing largely through social media. I'm getting so many questions from young people where they want to talk about investing first because it's sexy and cool and they saw it on TikTok. And we're like, no, we got to get the foundations. And then at the very end, I wish someone taught me about money as a weapon. Money is a political weapon. Money as a mm. tool for change. Yeah. I'm not done with your book, so I can't wait to get there. So in 2017, you paid off all of your debt mm -hmm. and saved up enough to travel for all of 2018, which is incredible. Were you planning to go back to corporate like a nine to five when you came home? What was your plan? 
My intention at the time was to come back and work for Instagram again. When I came back though, I had spent the year not just traveling, but I was also making content mm. more regularly about financial education, about being also sort of like digital nomad. And that's when I got my first taste of like, oh, a brand was like, can you make a video for us for $50? And I was like, $50 to do this thing that I do for free? Hell yeah, I'm rich. <laughs> Another brand's like $100. I was like, what? <laughs> is this how people make a living off of this? So by the time I got to the end of 2018, I felt like I was at a crossroads. I was like, okay, I can go back into the world that I know I'm comfortable with. Or I am in a specific part of my life where like I have very little to lose right now. If there's ever going to be a time that I try this creator thing, it's going to be now. And how I decided to do it is I had an entrepreneurial friend. She was like, I'm doing this business coaching retreat for like new entrepreneurs. We're going to Zanzibar. And I was like, Zanzibar? <laughs> couldn't tell you, couldn't point it on a map, but I want to go. And in my mind, I was like, this is me committing now because when I go to Zanzibar, I, I don't really want to go and be like, I didn't do anything. I'm just here for feelings. So I was like, if I commit to this, this is me saying yes to the entrepreneurial life. Yeah. Was that the time when you realized that talking about money rather than traveling and other things you've posted was really your sweet spot as a creator? Yes, a hundred percent. And I found that making financial education content, the more I grew a community, the more I talked to the people who came to me for advice and for relatability, the more I realized that this is not just about making fun content that's educational. It helps people to become financially empowered. It's changing lives. Yeah. And it sounds like for me, when I uplift others or advocate for others or empower others, it feeds my soul. Exactly. It's like being watered like a plant. It regenerates you at the same yeah, time. I love it. Let's talk about the realities of okay. finance for creators. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like every kid now, including my own kid, wants oh. to be a YouTube star, right? Mm. They all want to be Mr. Beast. Uh -huh. But let's start small. How do you budget and save when your income is coming from all different sources and also not on a regular basis? Oh, man. I got real lucky in that I was starting off my creator life, sitting on a little bit of savings from our travel year. And I was also living at home with family. It was easier for me at the beginning of my creator life to sort of skate by on inconsistent income. Mm -hmm. What I would have loved and what I, I would tell other creators is it's all about the runway. Runway, runway, runway is what's gonna keep you free put together like a creator emergency savings, calculating how much you need to run your business as it is for like three or six months, calculating how much you'd like to give yourself as a paycheck for three or six months, build that first and then leap. Yeah. What about retirement planning, especially when <laughs> things are feeling pretty lean? What would you advise people about planning for retirement as well? This is where I truly believe in a lot of ways, creator life and solopreneur life is for masochists. You can find free retirement calculators all over the internet. I really liked the ones from The Balance or Investopedia. You go on there, you tell the bot how much you might have saved right now, how much your life like looks like now, and then in the future, when would you like to retire? How much do you think you, you would want to earn every month exactly in mm -hmm. retirement? And this is all dream casting, of course, but it, it does the math for you and gives you a general calculation of how much you will need to save for retirement by the time you hit your ideal retirement age, 65, 70, whatever. And then those are sort of your new goals. Now you are responsible for creating the plan to get to that goal. And it's very daunting. Yeah. And so- I put away retirement savings every month like a bill. I don't consider it extra. I don't consider it, obviously, it was a privilege to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But I have to take it as seriously as an HR department would take it seriously for me if I worked for a company. I didn't know about the free resources. So thank you. I'm sure the listeners are really grateful for that tip. Who is in your money squad when you're a creator? Do you need an accountant if you can afford one? Do you need mm -hmm. a lawyer? And how does that grow over time? So who's on my money squad? I've definitely built it up very slowly and it's still very slim. But the first person I added to my money squad was an accountant during that first year, working with a bunch of different companies, getting little paychecks from a bunch of different companies. And then tax time came around. I got sent all these forms from all these different companies. And I was like, dear Jesus, what do I do? <laughs> that is when I got an accountant. And by got an accountant, I mean, I paid for one session to sit down with him and give him all of my 1099s and all my information and be like, do the thing master. So when I tell people I have an accountant, a lot of people who aren't creators are like, wow, so 
you keep them on your payroll. Like you pay them. I'm like, hell no, I pay Alan once a year. Yeah. In the first couple of years of working with Alan, he came to understand that like my taxes as a creator with a bunch of 1099s, pretty simple. But mm-hmm. I knew that I had booked 30 minutes or an hour and I was going to fill that time with all of my tax questions that I've been collecting. Any tiny tax question I had, I would write it in like a note on my iPhone. And then when it came to tax time, Alan was like, okay, well, I did all the thing. I pressed the buttons. Any questions? And I was like, as a matter of fact, I'd be sitting there for another 40 minutes asking him all my questions. And so this is how I squeezed accountant like steez out of one little session because it's not cheap. You paid for it. I paid for it. So I'm going to get my money's worth. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I started working with my agent, Tabia. She's incredible. She's part of my money squad. Can you tell the audience what an agent does for you? Because some people might not even know. What does an agent do? Absolutely. So an agent, they are for me, like first line of offense in terms of negotiating and vetting all requests. And so basically Mm -hmm. all requests, media requests, partnership requests, journalism requests, anything goes through Tabia first. She and her team will vet and take all the introductory calls and do all the 30 minute, 15 minute chats to figure out what these folks want. And then they come back to me and they're like, here are the people that have requests for you. Here is, and this is what I love about Tabia and her agency. Here's what I think are good looks for you in terms of what I know you care about, your target goals. Here are the people that are actually paying your rates and we've negotiated up. And so I get to be like, yes, no, yes, no. I have more questions for this. This is the date I want to do this. It is incredible. I also must add, Teresa, that I did not have an agent before Tabia, but I did have a fake agent. And by fake agent, I mean, I went on to Gmail, made a new Gmail, made up a white dude's name, took a white dude's face. My boyfriend's cousin at the time, I was like, it's cool if I use his face. I think I called him Jay. And I talked to brands pretending that I was my own agent. And it went well. My rates did go up as opposed to me just talking to them by myself. I am so glad you shared this story. What a secret weapon. You know, you wanted it to be a white dude because sometimes they get better rates. Oh, I was seeing before my eyes. Let me talk to this brand. They give me a certain rate and I'm like, oh, you know what? Let me see CJ. And then suddenly the conversation changes. Suddenly, oh, she's CCing her agent. Great. Now we should CC the marketing team and have a serious conversation about budget. Yeah. Suddenly they can meet my rate. Yeah. And it's just so like, this is an instance of me trying to leverage white supremacy to my advantage. And also I will say I'm a horrible negotiator. I am terrible. At, I'm still working on like asking for what I need. And so yeah. when I became Jay, it kind of gave me permission to like act differently yeah. and be who I wouldn't normally be in my own insecurities. And so I was like, white man Jay would ask for a double. White man Jay wouldn't put any exclamation points in this email. And it worked because I could play my own good cop, bad cop. And so then I would come in and be like, thanks, Jay. I'm so happy to work. And be Berna, you know, and so it was was fun. Wild, wild. You're going to love this question. Yeah. You seem like you're crushing it right now as Uh, a creator. (laughs) Okay, you're making content (laughs) online. You published your first book. You have brand partnerships. Mm -hmm. But behind that success, here's my question. Mm -hmm. Do you still worry about your financial security? Sure. Oh my gosh. It's funny that you bring this up now because in the last couple of months, I have felt a definite shift amongst the creators that I know, especially ones that have been in the game maybe three or four years. And we're all starting to look around and be like, this is not necessarily as sustainable as I thought it was going to be. And so usually for creators, summer's dead. People who are managing the budgets, everyone's on vacation. Usually by August, September, people are at their desks and then you start to get more partnership requests and more speaking requests. August, September rolled around and I was like, what is, what are these crickets? Am I being blacklisted? Did my book suck? Hold up. And it was only the last, honestly, like two, three weeks that I started to open up to other creators. Come to find out even creators who are 10, a hundred times bigger than me are like, I just applied for a part-time job. And so if I could go back to like my younger self who was starting off as a creator I kind of created this tension around it. You must stay a solopreneur in order to be seen as successful. And if you change that path or like if you get out of that path or step away, it's failure. I would want more creators to understand that it's okay to do what you have to do to keep that stability 
over the last few months have been like, if I'm not an entrepreneur, if I'm not a creator, who am I? I had to really reset and be like, it's not creator life that I'm dedicated to. It's not entrepreneur life that I'm dedicated to. It's the impact that I'm dedicated to is financial empowerment. Right. That can happen as a full-time creator, as a part-time creator, that can happen in a job. You know, like I need to remember what the impact is I want to make. And so for me, I'm on a new tack of I'm going to find stability and, and impact, whether that means taking on longer contracts, joining a team, joining a company, becoming in-house, allowing myself the freedom that stability like that could give while also like not letting go of my community. In fact, making the stability the thing that you know pays my bills and almost like going back to the beginning of when it was just fun to create mm -hmm. and fun to share with my community. I'm like, oh. I'm hitting reset in a big yeah, way. Yeah, without the pressure and without the stress. I love that you always talk about not just budgeting and saving, but you also love celebrating your money yeah. wins, right? Yeah. Why? Big. Why is that so important to you? Oh my gosh. I mean, we just don't have enough of it. There's not enough joy. There's not enough hype. There's not enough encouragement. We are all so isolated in our money lives. It's like us and our shame, us and our insecurities. And even when we do something good, like you pay a bill or you submit, you know, like a, a payment or something, is it click? Uh, yay. You might have busted <laughs> your ass trying to make that one payment, or you're paying off your student loans, you're paying off a credit card, click, yay. And th it's just not equal to the amount of work that we put in. You reward mm -hmm. yourself for a, a job well done, then you're going to continue to do that job. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not only important to celebrate your wins, but to celebrate your wins with other people. It's like supercharging the win. It's like a whole new joy hallway in your brain. And so I, I love to just open that up for people. Okay. My last question, Berna, what is your one word for this year? What has been the one vision word that mm -hmm. has guided you or motivated you? Uh, I am one of those woo-woo girls that picks a word at the beginning of the year. Okay. My word was unfold. 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 Because at the beginning of the year, you know, I'm looking into a year of launching my book, all this publicity, all this like more effort and loudness than I have ever pushed for in my whole solopreneur career. And I wanted to kind of harvest from the fruits of my labor. I was like, wow, like community that I've built up for the last few years, like have really shown out to my SF event, to my New York event, buying the books, sharing. I'm like, this is the unfolding of so many years of work. And then the second half of the year, which has been dampened a little bit by this creator economy change and, you know, financial stress, I'm understanding that that's a different kind of unfolding too, of allowing myself to let go of my like identity as a solopreneur creator. Then other opportunities happen when I'm not holding so tight because I think of something folded and it's compressed. If you like let it go, it opens, it's abundance, it's receiving. And so unfold, unfold is my word. I love it because it has multiple meanings. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Berna. We'll add all of the links to your social accounts and to your book and our show notes so that people know how to follow you for yeah. even more financial advice and laughs. <laughs> because I told you, you should have been a comedian. I'm not saying I'm not looking into it. I'm not saying I'm not expanding into the comedy world. So we'll see. see? We'll see. Finance, <laughs> comedy, what a combination edutainment is always going to be my bag, no matter what kind of job I have. So for sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I had so much fun chatting with Berna today. She's probably the only person on the planet that can get me so excited about finances. Her experience as a solopreneur makes her advice so spot on for creators today. Here are just some of the key takeaways that I got. One, your money story from your childhood impacts how you deal with your finances now as an adult. So take a look at those feelings, unpack them, and see where they're holding you back. Two, negotiations are so intimidating. Do whatever you need to do to build confidence, including creating an online fictional member of your money squad named Jay to speak for you. <laughs> Three, Take planning for your retirement just as seriously as the bills in your mailbox. Pay your future self every single month. You can follow Berna at Hey Berna on all the social platforms and check out our show notes for more links. My name is Teresa Ao. 
and this is in the making.